Okay, um, go ahead and begin. I'd like to welcome you. Um, uh, this lecture uh, is uh, facilitated uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Goodchild's visit uh, by Mr. Doug Caldwell here in the front row. And uh, Doug and a, and a few other folks from the uh, 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 Engineer Research Development Center at the Army Geospatial Center Fort Belvoir uh, facilitated this. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Nigel Waters, the director of the GIS Center of Excellence and uh, one of our esteemed uh, senior faculty members. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks very much, Matt. I really appreciate this. And I want to welcome everybody uh, from the department and from GMU to this very special talk uh, where Professor Michael Goodchild is going to uh, make this presentation. And I'm going to introduce him, and I feel very honored to do so. Mike is now a, an emeritus professor of geography at the University of California at Santa Barbara. He holds the title as research professor there. He's also an affiliate uh, with the Department of Geography at the University of Washington. Uh, he retired in 2012, uh, sort of. <laughs> I think he's been busier since 2012, uh, busier than ever. Uh, when he was at the UCSB, he was the Jack and Laura Dangerman Professor of Geography there. Of course, you know Jack Dangerman is the owner, with his wife Laura, of Esri. They own it. And so that was a tremendous honor. And he was also director of UCSB's Center for Spatial Studies. Uh, Mike received his BA degree from Cambridge uh, in uh, from Cambridge University uh, in 1965 in the discipline of physics. And his PhD is in geography from McMaster University, which he obtained in 1969. He then went on to teach at the University of Western Ontario for a number of years, uh, about 19 years. Uh, that's in London, Ontario, Canada. And he then went to uh, the University of California at Santa Barbara uh, for the remainder of the time, uh, for the remainder of his career. He headed up there, of course, the National Center for Geographic Information and Analysis, uh, which really launched the GIS revolution academically. Even more significantly, he is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. That's a huge, <coughs> just a huge honor. And, <coughs> Uh, in addition, he is, which is ironic, he's a foreign member of the Royal Society of Canada, and uh, he's a, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, a foreign member of the Royal Society, and a corresponding fellow of the British Academy. So that, again, is a huge, huge honor, uh, really a significant achievement. Very few, I think, uh, people in our discipline get to have that honor. In 2007, he received the Pre Votran Lud. There is no Nobel Prize in geography, no Nobel Prize. Uh, there is <coughs> no Nobel Prize in economics, but uh, there is a prize from the uh, a Swedish bank which is given to social sciences, and the economists have sort of cornered the market on that, which is very unfortunate because I think, well, I think it's time that the geographer got it. But this prize that he received is nicknamed the Nobel Prize in Geography. It's a prize from the French government, and the superstars of our discipline have been honored with that prize, and that prize includes uh, Mike, Mike Goodchild getting that prize um, a few years back in 2007. He's also been the editor of Geographical Analysis, the, uh, um, uh, the Methods, Models, and GIS section of the 
Annals of the Association of American Geographers, and he serves on the editorial boards of 10 other journals and book series, and published over 15 books and over 500 articles. I could go on and on, but you came here to listen to my good job. So thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Nigel, and thank you, Matt, and uh, thank you for the uh, uh, invitation to come here and do this. Um, I've, I'd like to uh, talk today about a perspective on geographic knowledge which makes a clear distinction between two perspectives. One is space and the other is place. And this is a distinction which we often blur. Um, people in GIS often talk about places um, without at the same time implying that they're taking a very different perspective. And so I'd like to elaborate on this and um, suggest at the end that what we really need is a, a clear distinction between the two and a um, much greater attention to the place perspective compared to the space perspective. I'm going to, I'm going to use the term placial as an adjective to match spatial. It's mm -hmm. kind of a, a new coinage, but I think it, it's useful in this context. So to make this work, I need to first talk about traditional GIS and to present something of a, um, it's a bit almost accused me of distorting uh, traditional GIS as I do this, but, but bear with me because I really need to do this in order to set this argument up. So traditional GIS has, ever since Roger Tomlinson's Center, uh, Roger Tomlinson's Canada Geographic Information System, has insisted that every reference to geography in GIS come with a coordinate. Whether it's latitude, longitude, or whether it's UTM, doesn't really matter. <laughs> This is the central concept of GIS. And yet, uh, I doubt if anyone in this room can tell me exactly where that location is. The ESRI campus? No. Very close. <coughs> it's actually Jack Benjamin's house. <laughs> um, it's resolved there to about 30 meters, which is a reasonable accuracy given the size of his house. <coughs> Um, but, <laughs> which is actually very small, I assume. Uh, but nevertheless, this is, um, my point is simply that while we deal in GIS with coordinates all of the time, we very rarely actually think in terms of coordinates and actually discuss coordinates and actually exchange coordinates verbally. It would be very unusual for anyone to refer in their, in their talking, in their daily discourse, and we use coordinates, of course, for a very simple purpose. Primary purpose being to link together things that are true of that place. So when I told you this was Jack Benjamin's house, I was giving you a piece of geographic information which might well sit inside a GIS. Despite that, even though we use location as the linkage between different layers of information, different kinds of information, despite that, we know that location can never be measured perfectly. There's no such thing as exact measurement on the Earth's surface. I referred to that as having a plus or minus of about 30 meters because it's been rounded to the nearest second. Um, I would not extend it to further decimal places because to do so would be violating a very, a very a principle which I learned as a student in high school, which is that in reporting a measurement, the the precision of the measurement should be tied to its accuracy. I would never express more digits because I can't justify them. I didn't measure them. They were an artifact of the measurement system. So this means then that when we use coordinates to link together data, we can never do it with 100% confidence. When you say that a certain, uh, when I say that's Jeff Benjamin's house, I'm not making a perfect statement. It's approximately Jeff Benjamin's house. But nevertheless, we do this, and of course, one of the reasons for doing so is so that we can measure distances, we can measure directions between points, we can do things like compute areas of, of parcels of land. This is very central to, to GIS. This raises a, an interesting question, which I've explored in, in some early papers, um, which is what I've called measurement-based GIS. And let me give you a quick example here. 
So here's a parcel of land represented by the <coughs> larger rectangle and the smaller rectangle, that's a house. And over in the corner of this parcel, there's a, let's say, a telephone pole, or maybe a, a utility pole. And you've been hired by the city government to go out and GPS, using GPS as a verb, to GPS every pole in the city. And the ultimate purpose of this is to use a GIS so that we can determine whose property each pole lies on. Now you're using GPS, and let's assume your GPS has an accuracy of perhaps 10 meters. You're using just a simple GPS like a cell phone. And there's five meters represented on the, on the, the map as a sort of scale bar. But <coughs> unfortunately, the pole is only about a meter from the property boundary. And generally, poles do tend to be pretty close to the property boundary. The consequence of this, and let's assume that I know the location of the boundary to maybe plus or minus a meter, but I only know the location of the pole to plus or minus, let's say, 10 meters. The result of this is that I cannot use geometry to determine whose property that pole lies in, because it is too close to the boundary. Its distance from the boundary is within the measurement area. This is the kind of problem, even though GIS promises to let us establish topological relationships through geometry. In practice, we can never do that to a great deal of time. Instead, we end up making mistakes like this. And we, in fact, recognize a principle in GIS, and you've probably heard this in various courses, and the principle is that topology should trump geometry. Because geometry is never perfect. And so we record whose property this lies on explicitly, instead of trying to, to compute it. Here's an example of the kind of problem I'm talking about. This is the national map. This is an extract from the national map for part of Galita, California. There are two layers here. One is an image layer. It's a digital ortho photo quad. And the other superimposed on it is the layer of streets from Tiger. And you can see there's a miss. Uh, the miss is about that much, maybe 15 meters. And I know, and you probably know, that the position of accuracy is claimed for these two data sets allow that. If this is 1 to 24,000 mapping, it has a position of accuracy of about 12 meters. This DOQ probably has a position of accuracy of about 6 meters, according to the National Map Accuracy Standards. Therefore, that 15 meters is actually allowable. The fact is, of course, typically we don't see it because we don't overlay things like this. But the fact is that all of our geographic data is subject to uncertainty. This is the basic point. So <clears throat> now enter the world of neogeography. The world of neogeography is defined by Andrew Turner in a book in 19, uh, 2006. It is basically about two ideas. Number one, it's about a redefinition of the role of the expert. So as it's become possible for anyone to get engaged with geographic data, in fact, to create geographic data, all of a sudden, the role of expert in this world is challenged. Because, in effect, the citizen has become expert. So we used to make a clear distinction between expert and expert, but the argument is simply that distinction is disappearing. It's a very challenging issue for people like us. We were the experts. <coughs> By calling these people neo-geographers, that has the alarming implication of making me a paleo-geographer, <laughs> which is not a predominant idea. But essentially, we have broken down the relationship. Anyone that can now use GPS, anyone can work with geographic coordinates, anyone can work with simple GIS functions. These things used to be limited to experts. Second aspect of neo-geography, which is actually the one that I'm trying to place the greatest emphasis on, is that the perspective of this whole world has become user-centric. So instead of a map using arbitrary lines of latitude and longitude for the limited, all of a sudden maps become centered on the user. When you bring up Google Maps on your cell phone, it's centered on you. It's no longer defined by lines of latitude and longitude. We have user-centered maps which are useful perhaps only to you. We have transitory maps which are used which are valid only at this moment. 
bring up a map of traffic conditions in Washington, D.C. right now, that will no longer be true in 10 minutes. We can afford to make maps of things that are true only now and useful only to us. Maps have become 3D so that things like street view give you the view from the street instead of the view from, from above. And all of this gets displayed on your device. So this is a very different world. This is a world which has emerged almost entirely in the past 10 years. It's continuing to emerge. And it provides me in this talk with a very strong motivation, which is to try to understand what's happening in this world, in this world of the world. And the point I'm going to make is that it's rebalanced the distinction between space and place. And that's really good. So let's just look at a few examples of the sort of things that are happening. This is Wikimedia. <coughs> Many of you, I'm sure, have been to it. It's a site which uh, has the mantra, let's describe the whole world, exclamation mark. And it allows you to go anywhere in the world and to input any feature, polygon or a single point, and to give it a description, give it a name. And last time I looked, Wikimedia had 24 million features on the Earth's surface, described in a whole series of languages, described using different alphabets. Now, this happens to be Lhasa in Tibet. And I've just highlighted one feature here. I've, I've um, moused over this feature. I've moused over this feature, and I've brought up the description of it as underground missile silo. Um, you may think this is pretty amazing, given that this is uh, China. Yeah. What are people doing identifying underground missile silos in China? But this was done by somebody. Um, my, my image of this person is that this is somebody sitting in their basement with a computer in the middle of the night, nothing better to do, they can't sleep, and so they've gone to add in the of the night. Here's another example. This is, of course, the best known. This is OpenStreetMap. And this is OpenStreetMap's coverage of uh, Port-au-Prince in Haiti, which was established within hours of the Haitian earthquake, a wonderful example of international collaboration by volunteers producing highly accurate geospatial data. And here's um, the CR. These are georeferenced tweets in um, Los Angeles over a period of about six weeks. This is the work of Linda Lee, one of my students. And uh, these are simply, well, you can see pretty much what you'd expect. Here's, uh, this is downtown, this is USC, UCLA, Hollywood, Santa Monica. The 405 freeway, of course, shows up. <laughs> and uh, this is the sort of information nowadays that we are creating. It's being created by people who have no expertise in this field, whatever. And they're simply uh, volunteering this information. We are devising ways of making these So those are just a few examples. Let's think now about the impacts that all of this is having. So it has, it's having impacts by making mapping more user-centric. It's having impacts by rebalancing amateurs versus expert. But what are the deeper impacts? Number one, what to map. It has now become possible for anyone to map anything. And one of the consequences of that is that the things people are choosing to map are very different from the things that we traditionally do. People are mapping underground missile silos in Lhasa. People are mapping trash in the streets, potholes in the streets. Things that we have never, USGS, NGA, has never mapped. So it has changed the notion of, of what to map. It has also changed the notion of when to map, because we can map things that are true right now. We can map real-time Something very different from what we have in the past. USGS, in producing topographic maps, deliberately chose to map only those things which were going to be true for as long as possible. It didn't map things that were true. Reasons for that are simply I don't know. But have maps for whom? Maps for me and no one else. All these are pretty profound changes to the whole world of mapping, the whole world of geographic information. And where to map? Where to produce the map? on my handheld device here right now. A very different world than the world of <clears throat> So 
So if this is a world that is user-centric, if it's a world in which the amateur is, is centrally involved, it raises a question that, that I'm asking here. How do people think about space? And if you, take, if you go back to my opening point, which was that people don't think in terms of latitude and longitude, I can generalize that to a broader statement that people don't think like a GIS. Why is GIS so difficult to learn? Because you have to change the way you think. You have to think in terms of latitude and longitude and polygons and polylines. These are not the ways people think. How does the average person think? It's a very important question if what you want to do is to make GIS technology easier to use. You don't want it to force people to think differently. You want it to allow people to think like they normally think. So how do people think about space? They don't think in terms of latitude, longitude, polygons, precise distances and directions. They don't think as GIS does. GIS is therefore difficult to learn. What they do emphasize is places. Places that are often vaguely defined don't have precise boundaries. Places that are often context dependent. So what exactly do you mean by Fairfax? Depends on the context. Depends probably on where you are, what, what you're trying to say about Fairfax. Places, people talk about imprecise distances and directions. They say things like Santa Barbara is north of Los Angeles. 99% of the population of California believes that Santa Barbara is north of Los Angeles. No, it's not. It's west of Los Angeles. But people talk about it as north because they think of the West Coast is running north-south, and so Santa Barbara is up the coast, it must be north. We have these naive views of geography. And most important, they identify places by name, not by latitude and longitude. So this is the world of places. This is the placial world. And this is the world, then, of what we might call the names layer, the set of names, named features on the Earth's surface. And so one of my points is that the names layer has become far more important than it has been in the past in GIS. One of the intriguing things is that the names layer, in fact, was never one of the seven layers of the National Spatial Data Infrastructure. We had layers of roads, we had layers of rivers and topography, but we never had layers of place names. Very strange. But if you think about it, names don't actually have a purpose in science. And not the sort of thing that, that a scientific or focused organization would, would, would emphasize. Names, in fact, got labeled as annotational. They're not a layer, they're something different. Names have shown up, of course, in the Gazetteer. Gazetteer is this rather obscurely named data set of named, officially recognized named places. And it's become Part of a whole process of regulation and standardization, capped by the Board on Geographic Names, of which the current chairman is sitting right here, which exists to standardize references to place names. But of course, it can only standardize references to official place names, which is actually the origin of the word gazetteer. So in a gazetteer, you will find the names of states, the names of countries, the names of cities. You will not find downtown Fairfax, because that's a vernacular name. You will not find downtown Redlands. Moreover, a, a gazetteer traditionally has dealt only with points. So let's, let's examine the question, where is the Mississippi River? Go to the board on geographic names and ask, where is the Mississippi River? Here's the USGS's geographic names information system. Mississippi River. There it is. Yeah, we know all about the Mississippi River. It's a stream. It's in Flat Mines County, Los Angeles, uh, Flat Mines Parish, uh, Louisiana. <coughs> Here's its latitude and longitude. Resolve to the nearest second of latitude and longitude. Resolve to 30 meters. And if I actually go find that point, there it is. That's where the Mississippi River is. Right there. Why has this happened? Because a gazetteer is limited to representing any feature as a point. And we have this convention, in fact, that a river, because it's an extended object, the convention is that its representative point is at the mouth. So if you were to query any river in the United States in the geographic names information system, this is what you would get. You don't get the fact that the Mississippi River is how 
point, 2,000 miles long, whatever. That doesn't come, what you get is a point. Here's another kind of accident of uh, this world in which features are reduced to points. Um, here's Google <coughs> being asked for driving directions. How do I get from Colorado to Wyoming? And oh, yes, we can do that. Here we go. Head east towards County Road number 1038. This road may be seasonally closed. There are times when you can't get from Colorado to Wyoming. And on and on. What it's actually solved, of course, is how to get from some centroid point in Colorado, some representative point of Colorado, up to some representative point of Wyoming. In fact, of course, nobody lives there, and nobody lives there. They're simply geometric points. So here's Google being stuck with this problem. Unless it's, a, it's about points, it's not about extending objects. But nowhere in this system has anybody figured out that all you've got to do is step across the border on I-25 and you get from a lot of them. OK, so I want to focus on this concept of place. So let me now expand on the definition of place. Place is the way humans think about the world Think about the world in terms of places. They don't think about the world in terms of spaces. Places can vary from the very large Asia to the very small my patio. And here's a speculation. I've been asking people about this recently, but let me, let me just uh, pose it to you. Um, each of you has a vocabulary in your native language. An adult English speaker you typically have a well-educated adult English speaker, something approaching 20,000 words. You are also familiar with a large number of places, but they're not in your vocabulary because they're proper nouns. How many do you have? How many places would you recognize? And this is scale independent, so it goes all the way down to named places in your house. And my speculation is that the number is of the same order of magnitude as the size of your vocabulary. But you can recognize locate on the Earth's surface tens of thousands of places. This is a vast field. In fact, it's infinite, right? because there are so many, there's only a certain number of countries, there's only a certain number of states, but when you get down to the level of my patio, you've got a huge number of many places. So all places have names, and that's how we refer to them. Names are the basis for organizing and linking information about places. Not coordinates, but names, and places of attributes. So this is this parallel world that I want to set up. It's not the world of GIS, it's a world of place, not a world of space. So we've got two different worlds here, space and place. Both of them have long been recognized as important by geographers. Geographers have talked about place for years, <laughs> decades, <laughs> centuries. They've also talked about space for centuries. But the world of place has never been a central part of GIS because it's awkward to do. GIS is about space because space is objective, we can formalize it, we can compute it out. Place, on the other hand, is subjective, vague, difficult to formalize. If I say downtown Fairfax, what I understand by downtown Fairfax will not agree with, I think I'd suggest everybody, anybody in this world. We would all have our different exactly what downtown Fairfax. And GIS can deal with places only if they have polygons around them, which means that a GIS is happy to deal with Fairfax County, it's happy to deal with State of Virginia, but it's not happy to deal with downtown Fairfax, not with a polygon. People, of course, have written about this. There's an excellent uh, collection of uh, chapters by Frank and Burra on places within determined boundaries. We've talked about it, but we haven't really dealt with it in any systematic way. So here's a few examples. Um, this is Paris. Here's the Seine River. And this is an analysis, again by Bernard Lee, of every Flickr photograph which is tagged with the words Eiffel Tower in quite a large number of languages. So she's also searched for the equivalent of Eiffel Tower in, in Italian, which I can't remember. And this is the simple density. And here, of course, is the Eiffel Tower. And it's surrounded by an ellipse because people <laughs> tend to step away from the Eiffel Tower and take pictures of it. And they step either in the northwest or the southeast direction. Typical thing. 
go the other way. And then you have things like this, which is Montparnasse, because you can see the Eiffel Tower from there, so people have tagged photographs from there. And um, this is Notre Dame. Um, it's not particularly easy to see the Eiffel Tower from Notre Dame. What tends to happen, though, is people tag a whole lot of photographs with a single set of tags. And so you get photographs of Notre Dame that also have the words Eiffel Tower in it. And this one, I have no idea. <laughs> That's close to the Stade d'Europe, but I can't imagine why anyone attending a football game, soccer game, or the Stade d'Europe would tag a photograph of the Eiffel Tower. But who knows why that happened. So this is an attempt, therefore, to take place and make it spatial. We are giving coordinates to a place. And social media clearly have a huge role to play. We wouldn't go to a, go to a gazetteer. We might well go to mine spatial media to find out where the place is. Here's some work by Ben Adams, a PhD student at UCSB. He's now a postdoc. And this is work he's done on travel blogs various corpuses of, of uh, travel diaries, and searching for different words, and looking for the co-occurrence of words, and then associating these words with different locations on the Earth's surface. So this is about the attributes of place, not the locations of place. And so he finds, for example, that you get a whole collection of references to height, climb, walk, mountain, steep, trail, from people who are describing uh, hiking experiences. Um, you get uh, people who are interested in um, wine, and this gets associated with words like bottle and taste and, and glass and so on. And then he's able to map those. So here is that wine cluster mapped over here. Um, very much what you'd expect, heavy concentration in Italy, um, in the wine producing areas of France, um, Bordeaux and Burgundy. Um, some unexplained <coughs> instances in the north of Scotland, um, in Northern Ireland. I don't think anybody's grown a grape in Northern Ireland in a long time. There, there is a wine industry in England which is taking off given the effects of global warming, but still, these, these are basically the norms. And here's um, two groupings one of People have mentioned a lot about cemeteries and, and memorials, and people have mentioned a lot about war. And they're quite distinct, um, different kinds of associations. Here are the associations with cemeteries here in the World War I, cemeteries, of course, in northern France. And here are the associations of battles, and we pick out all the places where people have visited because they were interested in battles. So this is adding, again, my own social media, to add attributes to places. Now, here's a, a classic example. This is um, the Beck map of the London Underground. This is the original version done in the 1930s. And, of course, if you've ever traveled on the London Underground, you'll be familiar with the modern version of this. And if you've ever used any transit system in any city in the world, you've used a map like this. Its significance is that, of course, it distorts space. It's not spatial. Distorts direction somewhat, preserves direction by rounding it to one of eight possible directions. It distorts distances by spacing the stations along a line at regular intervals. It emphasizes topology by showing where you can go through an interchange between two lines. It maintains a little bit of additional information, such as the approximate location of the tents. This is undoubtedly enormously useful to anyone traveling above the underground. Here's the spatial equivalent, which is hopeless, because the central London is so dense that you have to blow it up as, a, as an insert. Um, you waste a huge amount of space because of the long distances between the peripheral stations. Um, you even give up here, because this line simply goes off the map. So you don't do it that way. You want to do it spatially, not spatially. So there are enormous advantages to having a placial perspective. One of the things that got me interested in this whole topic was that I realized that every time I've been to Japan as a visitor, I have always been given a sketch map. And initially I got frustrated and said, why don't they have a parametrically correct map? I don't have a real map. But 
always that he'd give me a sketch map. And of course, after a while, I realized that the sketch map is far more useful. It shows the significant things and deletes the things that I don't care about. So here's a research topic, and, and hopefully you're going to identify some of the research topics as I go through this. The research topic here is how do I take the planimetric map and automatically create a schematic, not for general use, but for a specific origin and a specific destination, and for multimodal travel, because this is just a single mode. If you ever use the back map, you'll recognize things like this, that if you, um, if you wanted to go, for example, from um, from uh, Leicester Square to Colombo, you might learn very quickly that the distance, the length of that travel is only a couple of hundred feet. And it would be far more efficient not to use the underground. Right? But this map isn't going to tell you that. This map isn't going to tell you. Moreover, when you emerge from the underground at some station, you have no information about your surroundings at all. To make this multimodal integrate the travel of the underground with pedestrian travel, and you have a very useful view. What can we, uh, another, research, another research question would be, can you make this time sensitive so that the information you get at night is different from the information you get during the day? Because landmarks at night are different from landmarks. So here's uh, Microsoft Research. This is a research project that they've had over the last couple of years to create what they call a destination map. And this is actually online. If you Google Microsoft uh, destination map, you'll get this. It's part of Bing. And what it does is distort, but it does it automatically. You give it a destination location. This is my house. And it gives you a schematic of the area around my house so that you can find it. It blows up parts of the map and shrinks others and deletes streets that aren't relevant and tries to do the whole thing on that. I think this is, if you take a look at this, you can criticize it very, very easily. This is a very crude first attempt at doing something that I think is, is going to be a significant issue. Here's another version of the same kind of argument. This is a favela in um, Sao Paulo in Brazil. And um, this uh, report that I've, oh, no, that's the source. Um, there is a very interesting report by uh, Robin McLaren, who is a British surveyor. Um, and I've often asked myself a question over the years. Could you ever have volunteers creating a land ownership map, creating a desk? So cadaster, the, the map of who owns what, is a very important document. It has great legal significance. The idea of having volunteers create it is completely anathema. And you would expect surveyors to be passionately opposed to allowing volunteers to create the disaster. But McLaren's argument is this, that many, many people in the world live in areas like this. They will never afford to hire a surveyor to accurately survey their property. And yet, they want to make a claim. But let's look at this not spatially, not in terms of surveying to the nearest millimeter, but placially. Why shouldn't they be able to register the existence of their place? Who cares exactly what its coordinates are? Who cares surveying to the nearest movie? What's important is to register its existence. And his argument, therefore, is that this whole thing could be crowdsourced. We could crowdsource ownership, even down to the level of the value. Because with a spatial approach, that would be So here's a brief summary. Here, Here's the spatial perspective on the left and the placial perspective on the right. Space is a world of coordinates and layers and distances, planimetric maps, <coughs> linkage through coordinates, GIS databases. Place is a matter of names, hierarchies of places, which I'll talk about in a moment, ordering of nearness, sketch maps, linkage through names, point of interest databases and casualties. Very different world. So, what do I mean by hierarchies of place? In a placial world, a place can be part of a higher level place. So Redlands is part of the Inland Empire. The University of Redlands is part of Redlands. Lewis Hall is part of the University of Redlands. It 
any part of the world, there are hierarchies of places. Small places can be parts of larger places. And a place hierarchy does not require polygons for containment. So you think, and I think, of Disneyland Paris as part of Paris. Technically, it's not. There is no official boundary of Paris which includes Disneyland. Disneyland is outside any official definition of Paris. But nevertheless, in the way we talk about it, it's a part of Paris. And it's important to know that it's part of Paris. So you don't think about hierarchies of place as containment. You don't have to be inside a polygon to be part of the hierarchy. So it's a very different idea of hierarchy. So let's, I think it's interesting to go through standard GIS functions and ask, what is their equivalent in a place of world? Let's take the example of buffer. So what might be the equivalent of a buffer in a palatial world? Buffers require that you measure distance. So they seem to be inherently spatial. But can we make them palatial? So here's a question. Is A near B? To resolve that spatially, you would say, yes, if B is within a buffer around A. And the buffer distance would define near. So if I say near means 100 meters, I put 100 meters. I say near means a kilometer, I put one kilometer buffer, and then I look at the container. What's the palatial equivalent? And here's a suggestion. Yes, if A and B are within some higher level place C, they're both part of the hierarchy underneath C. And the difference in level, how far apart they are in the hierarchy, defines near. So yes, Paris and Marseille are both are near because they're both inside France. Yes, um, the Eiffel Tower and, and Notre Dame are near because they're both inside Paris. And what I mean by near is determined by how far the hierarchy are. So here's another question you might ask. Is B nearer to A than is C? <coughs> so in a spatial world, you compute the distance from A to B and the distance from A to C, and you compare them. In a palatial world, you could say, yes, if A and B are in the same higher level place and C is not. So if there is, exists a higher level place that A and B are both part of, but C is not, then I could say that B is nearer than C. So let me just uh, go through an example of that. Let's go back to Paris. I don't know why I'm pretty really emphasizing Paris here. Uh, but let's take three features, the Eiffel Tower, the Orsay Museum, and Notre Dame. And the question is then, which is nearer? I'm, on, I'm a tourist, I'm at the Eiffel Tower, I'm looking at my watch and saying, well, I can, I can afford to, I've got time to go to one more attraction. Um, I'm really keen to go to the Eiffel Tower, uh, go to uh, the Orsay Museum, also very keen to go to Notre Dame. Um, which one's closer? And I don't have a map, I'm not measuring distances, I don't have a GIS. I want to ask that question placially. And the palatial response would be this, that the Orsay Museum and the Eiffel Tower are both within this pink area, which is the seventh arrondissement of Paris. But Notre Dame is over here in the fourth arrondissement. Therefore, from a palatial perspective, the Orsay Museum is nearer the Eiffel Tower than it is Notre Dame. Because Eiffel Tower and the same museum are both in the same arrangement, and in Notre Dame is in a different way. Well, here's another way, and this is more like the Beck map. This is the equivalent of the Beck map for Paris. This is the metro system in Paris. And if you look carefully at this, you might find the Eiffel Tower station, and the Orsay Museum station, and the Notre Dame station. And you would notice they're all on the same line, so the order defines nearness. So in a palatial world, we can order distances, even though we can't measure them. So these are the kinds of things we can get into in terms of developing, and I want to call this a theory of place. I think after several decades of GI science, we have a very strong theory of space. We know a lot about space, we know geometry, we know various theories about geographic information. In a palatial world, is there an equivalent theory? And I think what I'm trying to sketch here is the beginnings of a theory. In the palatial world, we have hierarchy, 
you can have equivalents of things like views <coughs> based on uh, arguments we make. Now, let me just uh, take this in one further direction, and I think, uh, I hope I can convince you that this is uh, part of the same uh, set of issues. Here is a map of the Himalayas. This is downloaded from Google Maps, and it's what you would get if you went right now to Google Maps and ask for a map of this area of the world. And what I'll focus on is the fact that some of the international boundaries are dashed. So here are the boundary between, um, uh, let's take this one over here. The uh, boundary between China and India is dashed around Arunachal Pradesh because Arunachal Pradesh is a disputed province of India. China claims it and India claims it. And so on an international map is shown as dashed. And notice all the boundaries around Kashmir are dashed because it's disputed between India and Pakistan. And this boundary is dashed because it's disputed between India and China. Now, if I were to make exactly the same request from a <coughs> internet site in India, Google would check my IP address, would locate me in India, and would give me this map instead. So, let's see. What I get is the official Indian policy, I get the official Indian claims of terror. And if I were to do exactly the same thing in China, this is what I would get from mainland China, but not Hong Kong. Hong Kong I would get the, 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 the international map. So this shows clearly that Arunachal Pradesh is a part of China. And it's the official Chinese policy. Google has had to agree to this in order to operate within China. They have to agree to show the official, the official policy. So what's happening here? What's happening is a tip of a very large iceberg, which is that there is no such thing as one map. There's the map for you, there's the map for me, there's the map for China, there's the map for Hong Kong. And as we delve into this more and more, we'll see that this is more and more pervasive. Well, what are the implications of this? Because this is, again, the consequence of engaging the community. And I'm going to explore this just a little bit. Um, this is the other end of the spectrum. This is the work of David Mark and Andrew Turk in Western Australia. They've been working with a uh, Aboriginal tribe called the Indian Bardi and asking them about how they view the landscape. What places, what features do they identify in the landscape? And the point, of course, is that the features they identify are not the features we would identify. In the language of this uh, group, this kind of feature, a dry riverbed, has a special name. It's called a lumbu. And they want to map it because it has all sorts of significance. To it. This thing has a name. It's a garden. We don't have a name for this. Right? But it's worth mapping because it's a place where there's a greater probability of game because the moisture tends to be. So it's not just a question of what to call, it's also a question of whether you map it or not. It becomes a local, linguistically, culturally defined thing. So as I say, this, this is a very pervasive issue. And what it has meant, essentially, is we have to recognize that names are social constructions. It matters, then, who calls it that, what is it called, but also who calls it that. So if you go to a map of French map, the English channel will be called La Manche. It changes when you change the, the cultural map. Whose national mapping agency made the map? Which community made the map? Matters. There's no such thing as a single map. What type of feature is it? In whose system of types? Where is it and where is its boundary? All these become open questions in this world of citizen dominated. So I want to. Uh, talk briefly about something called schema.org, which is an agreement between Microsoft, Google, and Yahoo to establish a common markup vocabulary worldwide. So insofar as they're involved in marking up information, their idea is that there should be a single unified markup language. It simplify the job of webmasters who want to give meaning to their work pages content. Now, if we look into schema.org a little bit, and the top level is thing. And then at the next level, you get immediately the place, which is something that has a, a spatial um, 
existence. And here's a list of the recognized types for sports activity location. And I hope you can see that this is the kind of list you would make if you were making a list in the California New And if you go to place retail activity, you will find that one of the items in the list is Asian grocery store, which has meaning in San Jose, California, but no meaning whatever in Beijing. So again, this is culturally, linguistically determined. This is all in English, it's all in the Roman alphabet, with no attention paid to any of it. So oddly, this was happening in 2011, in 1913, there's an odd echo of what happened in 1913. Because in 1913, a project called the International Map of the World, the map was begun to create a complete map of the world according to internationally agreed standards. Roads were depicted in red, towns and railways in black, labels in the Roman alphabet. Okay? Try to translate that to the Inter Barndi and Western Australia. It doesn't make any sense. Um, interesting, 1913, where do you think the conference was held? Where in the world would you convene in 1913 a group, an international group, to define a standard map of the world in 1913? One year before the outbreak of World War I. Where was the center of power in the world? London. The center of the British Empire is where this project originated. <clears throat> Schema.org in 2011 originated in California. So the trying to center of power had shifted from <laughs> government of Britain, the Imperial government of Britain, to the three leading <coughs> IT companies in the world. Here's how far it got. This is after the end of World War II, the coverage that the international world map of the world had, had established before this time. So this to me is a very significant fork in the road. It's not a technological issue, because I think we can support either of these perspectives. This is a social issue. And the issue is this. If we go global, we have one global map, one markup language, one universal consensus on what to map. And that's represented by the map of the world in 1913, or the schema of the in 2000. The alternative is to go local. Many maps, cultural and linguistic variations in what to map, based in community. And my argument is simply that the transitions that have occurred as a result of neo-geography in the past 10 years have taken us from here to here. This is the focus of this new world of user-centered mapping. It's mapping that originates in community, mapping with social construction. So let, let me just step back and I'll wrap this up. And um, here are some of the research issues that I think um, are, to me at least, very stimulating that come out of this kind of argument. Um, if, if sketch maps reduce cognitive load, in other words, they simplify so that we can easily understand, then how can we open it? How can we make, simplify, sketch, create sketch maps to reduce cognitive load to display on small devices? A simple example would be, can you replicate the algorithm that Beck used to create the Beck map? Can the generation of sketch maps be customized to specific origins and destinations? That's the Microsoft research example. The personal profiles, the day and night, to multiple travel modes. An extension of what Beck was trying to do, much more personal. And can we develop a theory of place that's in parallel with spatial theory? And that, 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 that pointed to the hierarchy as one, one of the possible directions. Can we enrich the gazetteer slash point of interest database, the database of all of these named places. Enrich, I think, in terms of sonification. Can we build systems which sound out place names and respond to spoken queries? Because that surely is a way of getting over the differences of language and differences of alphabet. Um, can we enrich gazetteers with feature extents so that we don't have to see the uh, Mississippi River as being a point in Louisiana? And can we enrich gazetteers with cultural and linguistic differences? And so just to, to sum, on, uh, sum up, um, point number one, and I think this is a very fundamental point for anyone interested in GIS, do we make too much of planimetric accuracy? 
We spend a lot of time measuring coordinates, but is that actually useful? How useful is it to know the coordinates of this point are in 38 north and 77 north? So what? For many applications of GIS, that doesn't matter. So I think that's a, a very challenging and interesting question. How should GIS evolve as it increases exposure to the general public? We need to make it easier to use. We need to make it think more like people do. Does that inevitably shift us into a placial world, not in a spatial world? Um, is place where the clarity of science meets the messiness of human society? Space, the spatial approach evolved because it's clean, it's scientific, it's replicable. We move into a placial world, and all of a sudden, a whole paradigm shifts. And should GIS become more placial, or should there be a separate parallel placial thing? One way to answer that is to work out exactly what a placial technology looks like first, and then see to what extent it can work. So, thank you very much for your attention. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mike. Indeed, that was absolutely amazing. Um, it is, uh, that is very kindly allowed me to coordinate the question and answer session. So now it's your turn. Um, are you all just, uh, as the English would say, gobsmacked? Whoa, that was awesome. But are there any questions? Yes, please. Right here. Uh, sir, uh, forgive me, you said that the technological, you said that the technological piece mm. seemed rather uh, uh, not easy to accomplish, but accomplishable. Mm. Uh, but uh, I'm struggling with how to accomplish it myself. Yeah. And I wondered, you know, whereas the, the, the tools of the GIS and the spatial GIS really reside in topology, uh, would a more placially informed GIS rely upon set theory and computational linguistics uh, more than, than topology? Well, no, it would, it would certainly rely on topology, because topology is one of the things that the that preserves. You, you need to know the order of stations. You need to know the uh, interchange points. And um, what what Beck is able to do is preserve through the through the topology to preserve enough of the geography, the, the geometry, to make the thing useful. So all of these sketch maps preserve some of the geometry, um, and they certainly preserve almost all of the topology. Uh, so no, I, I don't think it's it's a topology geometry kind of issue. Um, the reason I said that, that, the, uh, that it's not a technological issue is that we, we're fully able to support multiple names, multiple names of places. We're fully able to support gazetteers which tie to who calls it, uh, which linguistic group has it come out. Uh, we're fully able to, to use um, coding schemes that are multi uh, multi -alphabet. So all of, those, all of those are doable. We're fully able to sonify. Um, which is what makes it seem to me more like a, a social issue. It's a, do we want there to be one map for everybody? Or are we willing to allow that different communities would have, and have different ways of doing it? That, that's a social question, it's not a technological question. So that, that's my reason for, for saying that. Um, it reminds me of um, the days when my first, the birth of my first daughter had to be registered by the official statistics office in the province of Ontario. And at the time, the office had been computerized. They were very proud of their computerized system. But one of the limitations, it was, of course, the in COBOL, one of the limitations was that it couldn't sustain more than eight characters for the last name. So my daughter had to be registered as good chill and not good child. <laughs> um, because this was one of the things that was necessary in order to adapt ourselves to the computer. But I think if we've learned anything over the last 50 years, it's that you should use computers. You shouldn't force people to adapt to the computer. You should adapt the computer to the person. And that's, I think, a very strong idea here. Um, it gets mis mixed up in, in politics, but that's essentially what So it's not a technological issue. It's have a very rich technology which can support all kinds of diversity. <coughs> I think there is Fabini's law, isn't that right? Like, uh, something about uh, first we adapt the technology oh. and then uh, um, 
the, uh, and then we uh, we uh, mold the technology, and then the technology molds us. Yeah. Basically, yeah. 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 I think it's going to be useful. Yeah. Um, yes. Other questions? Yes, please, Ron. Uh, so, considering the uh, what GIS represents when it was first defined, and uh, comparing that to your approaching theory of what play shows, would it be that, uh, would you comment on this? Is it that the definition of GIS is being redefined and it's moving towards a facial definition? Or is it just two separate theories altogether? Or is it the middle man, like some transition? Yeah, I, uh, well, the comment I made was that I, I think we make progress best by creating first an isolated facial perspective and then asking, can we, can we merge it? Um, we could also take our spatial technology and modify it so that it becomes more placial. But the, 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 place, the, the spatial concepts are so central to GIS, right? This insistence that everything be referenced to latitude and like lat long or, or UTM. Um, we can't, GIS is so reliant on that that, that it's really, so fundamental we can't modify GIS to, to get away from that. So I, I think um, I've struggled for years with, with various examples of how the original choices we made in developing GIS have turned out to be bad choices. And one of them is that. Um, the notion, Roger Tomlinson and everybody else had, that you could, that you should, every point should be globally referenced. In fact, it's a very bad choice. Um, why, why do we need to know exactly where this point is with respect to the, the equator and the Greenwich Meridian? Well, my question is basically, how far am I away from you? Um, it's very tempting. It's, well, why don't I just get out and measure them? You know, I, I can estimate my distance from you right now much more accurately than I could from a GIS when you take into account the fact that I can't measure your position to bed on about 10 meters, and I can't measure my position to about bed on about 10 meters. I can get a much better estimate out of my head. That's one of the consequences of that decision we made a long time ago. It was made naively on the assumption that ultimately you could be perfect. That even though your maps weren't perfect, they would eventually become perfect. And if you start with the assumption that no map can ever be perfect, you don't go that way. Um, similarly, it's been, it's been really hard to introduce the concept of uncertainty into the GIS because those decisions never accommodate they never assume that you would ever need to be worried about uncertainty. I remember the first time I raised the question of uncertainty in a meeting in 1977. Roger Tomlinson was sitting right there, and I gave this talk about uncertainty. He said, why do we need to be worried about this stuff? This is, this is nonsense. <laughs> Forget about uncertainty. And now, of course, we know that it's, it's hugely important. So that, that's, um, that's where I come from on that. I, I think it would be cleaner to, to begin with designing a purely palatial and that would be a much better way of getting at the fundamental theory in place. Um, just one last comment on that. I think that um, what I'm presenting here, of course, is not um, an accurate reflection of how human geographers have talked about place. Right? That what Yifu Tuan would say about place, what he says about place in his books, is far more nuanced than what I'm saying. What, what I'm talking about is how concepts of place can be adapted so they can be computed about. And that's not something, of course, that Ifa Tuan is ever thinking about, or anybody else is talking about place in general. Okay, so beyond placial analysis, you have uh, uh, geographic information science is adopting a lot of other types of analysis, like social, political, and economic analysis, yeah. and, and, it's, and it's difficult to define concepts like distance and direction with that. So do you think that what you're talking about here has a lot of potential for all of the different types of analysis that's being adopted oh, yeah. by in, in geography, social, political, economic, whatever? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I mean, when I was talking about buffer, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Right. right? Because there's how many functions in, in ArcGIS desktop version 10.1 at 810, I think? You go through every one of them. And ask, what does this mean, patient? Yeah. And that's a, a very worthwhile research project that I haven't done. Sure that somebody needs to do.
the question? Joy. Uh, yeah. Yes, I think that this is a great talk and help me to understand the growth of uh, GIS in terms of spatial and pace and uh, other elements. And from your talk, you, you found that correctly. The spatial is really on the numbers, on the coordinates, mm -hmm. uh, based on that. Yeah. And then the place is really based on the recognition about how we realize what's out there and how we talk about that. Um, so in the spatial side, it's well defined. We have the tools to deal with. On the spatial side, we don't have so much good right. technology to deal with it. So in that regard, um, on the computer science side, people have, have been thinking about the computers being able to reason in as people. So how, in that direction, um, how do you consider the future of spatially based on that kind of recognition or surgery being computable? Or that utilize to facilitate the place based GIS or maybe something? Well, it's, it's probably occurred to you that what I'm talking about um, here is, is strongly related to linked data. Um, the notion that information is about <coughs> linkages. Right. And um, it's the place name that provides the link. Well, yeah, the linkages and also on the reasoning using um, college and yeah. linkage and all yeah. those. Um, yeah, a lot of aspect is that giving now the, the place based is based on recognition, and now we have a lot of uh, volunteers of GSIs coming up, for example, VGI, Foxhorse, and yeah. others. So those could be contributing a lot to the recognition. Yeah. So, how do you see those uh, emerging field is changing the place based GIS? Really? Um, well, I, I think um, place is, is very naturally linked to some of the research directions in GI science, such as public participation GIS, VGI, um, and not so well, of course, to others. So um, the uncertainty research direction is, is very spatial, um, talking a lot about positional accuracy and those kinds of issues. But more broadly, I think um, the spatial versus placial it is happily within GI science. Um, GI science doesn't bias us in either direction. <clears throat> it's simply about geographic information. And information about place is just as geographic as information about space. Um, so it, it, to me, this is a big missing part of, of GI science and potentially a very interesting development direction. Um, it's happening already. There's a special issue of um, uh, the Spatial Cognition Journal um, on computational models of, of place. Um, and this sort of thing will, will continue to happen. A lot of that work is at the interface. So it's saying, here's a place. It doesn't have a polygon, but can I nevertheless give it coordinates? And that's the sort of work that some of the data mining work that people like Chris Jones have done mining social media, like I was doing with Darfield Tower, um, to delimit um, places that aren't well-defined spatially. Um, there's the stuff that um, Dan Montello and I did on, on downtown Santa Barbara, where we did some human subjects and work, and, and we looked at alternative representations of a place in a spatial world. So there's a lot of work at the interface. Um, but to me, the most exciting intellectually intellectually exciting area is, is to take place pure and simple and not think too much about the interface. Uh, because the idea of a theory of place, I think, is enormously interesting. Um, so for example, here, here's, a, here's a researchable question. Um, to what extent is the, are the attributes of a higher level place, how are the attributes of a higher level place derived from the component places? So to what extent are the attributes of Paris derived from the attributes of the Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame, Musée d'Orsay, whatever. That kind of relationship within the hierarchy is, I think, a very interesting researchable question. Um, <clears throat> the answer is obvious when, when you're dealing with sort of, you know, things like total population. Um, but the kind of palatial attributes are, are very perceptual. They tend to be somewhat. Um, so you, you, could, you could test that with respect to the, the work that I showed from Ben Adams, right, where he was finding attributes of, of places. You could ask to what extent are those attributes, how are those attributes derived from the component places that he's looking at? Did you have a question? I saw Matt's hand. Yeah. If we were to uh, 
take the gadgets here and move from the point to something else uh, to better reflect what it's like the Mississippi River. Um, are, we, are, you, are we just using other geometry types? All <coughs> yeah. Well, and then, do we just go back into the GIS? Are we just adding place names to GIS instead of... Right. There, there's two levels to this discussion, right? Because you could... If you replaced Mississippi River as point with Mississippi River as polyline, yeah. you've stayed within a spatial domain. Right. You've simply given coordinates to the extended object. <coughs> That's all spatial. And in a placial domain, a lot of places will never do that because they don't have limits. So there will never be. Um, if you take, um, well, Lena, um, one of the things she did with the, um, uh, the um, Flickr database uh, was to look at Sen River because we were interested in what happens with an extended object. So Eiffel Tower is close enough to a point that, that we want to look at Sen River. And you can do the same thing. You get, you get a, a ribbon, um, but it's not purely spatial because there are plenty of references to Sen River actually outside the, the double casing of, of the Sen River. How does she describe? what she sees uh, without resorting to the digging into the geometry and spatial measures? From the hierarchy, um, from the, the lower level places and the high level places. So Seine River, Seine River is in Paris. That's a purely spatial um, statement, purely glacial statement. Um, Seine <coughs> River um, passes the following islands. All of these are, are purely glacial statements about the center. They're geographic, um, but they don't imply any kind of containment. In my mind, I'm thinking that this is actually a very natural thing. I, specifically, when we're in a car and we're thinking about things like direction, we're relying not on the map and the coordinates, but we're relying on the verbal right. communication. Right. This maps very well to how we communicate, which is what place names not with uh, coordinates. And in the same context in California, the, the notion of actual kind of geometry of the coastline is not the same. If, uh, in Santa Barbara, some people consider Santa Barbara extremely close to San Jose. Right. And you know, commute on a daily basis just very quickly on the flight. Yet, you know, so right. I'm thinking this is much closer to the human world than people. Probably. Yeah, Thank except you. as you know with Salt Lake City, which, because in Salt Lake City, street addresses are actually spatial. Yeah. They're measures. Yes. Right. They're not just orderings. They're actually measures of distances from the, from the uh, town. Another question here. Yeah. Comment about the Eiffel Tower flicker. I think your cluster up there may have been uh, where Mont Montre is, so it's about elevation. No, it's not. It wasn't? No. I couldn't tell. Yeah, Montmartre is way over here. Yeah. Oh, well, there. Okay. Yeah. Now, what it does, in fact, Montmartre wasn't showing. Yeah. So what you're describing here from a placial point of view is really, it's, it's really a social, anthropological yes. yeah. artifact, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we've been dealing with that forever. Yeah. So, you know, the whole AI revolution, which I was part of in the early 80s, you know, we thought by now computers would do everything, would understand everybody. <laughs> But then you look back and say, look at the language change. So whatever we put in place is going to have to be adapted, right? And so because of that, I think over time it's got to be something that is use case based, like we were talking, you know, a little bit about computer science. And I always go back to like Sete's work in HP analytic hierarchy process, which is all about interview questions to develop this hierarchy, which is then a typology and then there's lots of good graph theory for working that typology. And I haven't looked at what Stephen Wolfram is doing, but he's doing something similar. And he's invested a ton of money in the last 10 years trying to figure this problem out. Right. I don't know whether you or anyone else has looked at what he's doing and how that's related. No, but I think you're touching on something very important, which, which is that by limiting GIS to the spatial perspective, we have created a stovepipe. Yep. And if we want to open that up, place becomes a very interesting way of opening it up. It becomes surely a, a much more effective way of communicating between 
the GIS community and the social sciences, which have always been somewhat fraught. Um, but um, by focusing on place rather than space, by saying, no, you don't need to change the way you think, um, we are able to support you with a useful technology. I think that en enormously broadens the, the appeal. Yeah, and I, like yourself, a great physicist and an astronomer, when you design, you know, flights through space, it's really actually very dynamic where you are. Yeah. Because you don't know what the gravitational effects are when you're flying through space. So it has to, you don't, even though everybody calls it spatial, it's not really spatial. It's really dynamic based on what you're learning as you're doing it. And I think, you know, the break your placial problem is going to, end up being something that's going to be adaptive as you're working through yep. the process almost in real time on your device. Very context dependent. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah. Um, can you describe the uh, example with the buffer of the distance? With, uh, from the spatial perspective, the, the buffer the spatial uh, with the hierarchy. The hierarchy does answer, uh, explain the, the point A is closer to B than C. The, the real measurement, if for, for, for example, a tourist is to walk or to uh, take that measure, for example, uh, how can it be explained for the patient with the hierarchy? Um, you, you, um, you're, you're only making an estimate. Um, but the argument, I think, would be that um, a, a tourist, um, certainly my experience in Japan, where, where I'm given a sketch map, is that the sketch map is is still nevertheless very useful. I mean, as, as a walker, I'm not overly concerned with whether I'm walking a mile and a half or two miles. Um, they're both within my sort of same. They're both they're similar in my frame of reference. So um, this goes back to my question: Are, are we excessively spatial in, in a lot of what we do? Um, uh, what I'm much more concerned about is, is uh, if I'm traveling the London Underground, is how many stations I have to pass. Right? Um, when I used to travel the Underground a lot, I, I, I had a heuristic, which was that um, the time distance between any two points was three minutes times the number of stations. That was much more useful to me than, than knowing the actual linear distance, uh, which I couldn't have accessed anyway. So I, I think this, um, it's, a, it's a very, what, what it, it begins with the assumption that the detail in the spatial world for many purposes is, is not relevant to, the, to an average human. And that instead, um, things like the order of stations or containment within a higher level object um, are actually more important to somebody. Uh, I think, uh, well, actually, Ron, you've had one, so we'll, we'll uh, go, no please go ahead. Um, how does time kind of figure into it? Like, so if I said my house, you know, like, that's great now, or even, like, the capital of the United States, you know? It used to be Philadelphia. Like, can you kind of incorporate that into it? Oh, into oh yeah. Yeah, because um, place, well, one of the things we, we got interested in was um, places that move. Right. And yeah. so we started mining social media for the Olympic torch. Right? Um, which keeps moving around. Right? And so what you get is a space-time track coming out instead of just a, 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 a location. So yeah, um, time, um, places change their name through time, um, which is the county in Wisconsin, um, Portage County, that I think uh, has, has been the same name as applied to two different counties at different points of time. Um, you get fictitious places, we came this morning, um, Camelot. Uh, everybody recognizes the place named Camelot. Nobody knows where it was. Um, so things like things like that are all part of this palatial world, which partly makes it very interesting. I'll let you have another one, Ron. Go ahead. Uh, well, I have asked this question many times before. Um, so what's the uh, geography of a discipline? And the uniqueness that geography offers compared to other disciplines since the tools, the techniques, the ideas are being uh, used and broadcasted across the different disciplines. So right. it's, it seems like you, yep. there's no geography here. It seems like it's geography is more of a blue rather than yep. an no, um, Geography is so, a multidisciplinary <laughs> science. So I, I've uh, I spent a lot of time recently thinking about um, 
do I think different? I'm deliberately playing off Steve Jobs there, right? instead of saying differently. Do I think different? And um, how do I think different as a result of five decades of exposure to, to this technology? And there's some very, very simple answers to that. Um, so, for example, um, one way I think differently is that I would never trust a length that has come out of a GIS. Because the GIS representation of a line is typically a polyline, and a polyline is always shorter than the real object that it represents. Yep. That's an example of how I think different. Right? So I, I, my, I, I tend to uh, use examples like this. What, what if you were in an elevator and um, you were stuck there for 30 seconds and you had a, the opportunity to ask one question of the person standing next to you and you wanted to determine if that person had similar exposure to spatial thinking. Was this person a geographer or not? And so um, what question would you ask? And so my favorite question is, uh, uh, how long is the coastline of Italy? <laughs> and um, so you can go to, uh, let's see, what is there? There's, um, I have to remember the numbers. Um, if you go, there's an ASPRS site which offers to tell you, it's the Association of uh, American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, will tell you that the coastline of Italy is, I think, it's about 3,000 kilometers long. But if you go to Wikipedia, it will tell you something completely different. And if you go to so the World Resource Institute, I think, has the lengths of, of countries by coastline. And it gives you the length of the coastline of Italy to one decimal place. Uh, and there's more than 7,000 kilometers. Right? So what's going on? Well, what's going on, of Fractal course, is geometry. it's fractals. Right? <laughs> the, the closer you look at a real geographic object, the more detail you see and the longer it gets. Right? Very simple principle that someone who's been in this field for a while would surely know. Or um, the Burning Man Festival. If you go to the website of the Burning Man Festival, it will say, <coughs> the Burning Man Festival is held in the second flattest region in the United States. Well, you might say, well, okay, what's the flattest? But you might also say, well, that implies that there's a finite number of regions in the United States. And of course, there isn't. There's an infinite number of regions. You can define any number of regions you want. So what does it mean? Right? Well, what it means, it's a modifiable arrow unit problem. The answer to the query depends exactly on how you define the region. So there's no answer to the question. But we get, we respond to these things instinctively after we've been in this field for a while. Um, you say, uh, um, the digital elevation model of this part of the world um, has a vertical accuracy of, uh, let's, let's be liberal and say, two meters. Root mean square of two meters. Okay? If that means that every point could be up or down by two meters, and you, have, you sample a couple of points five meters apart, that means you couldn't possibly estimate the slope of anywhere, anywhere on the campus, right? Because you could be at the same time. Right? The fact is we can. And the general principle that's involved there, which is something that we learn, is that uh, relative accuracy is always better than absolute accuracy for all geographic data sets. You can estimate the relative elevations of two nearby points much better than you can estimate the absolute accuracy of either point. And there's all sorts of principles like this, uh, which, which get onto a list called how I think different. And we think differently. There's no doubt about it. If, if I go to a presentation by a political scientist or an economist and they're doing an analysis of the US by state and there's a scatter plot and one of the points on the scatter plot is way off and I say, where's that? I say, well, I don't know. Why would I why would I be interested in where that is? Because if I knew where it is, I could associate it with other things I know about that location. Right? A very, very simple geographic principle, but one which is absolutely alien to people who don't have this kind of background. So I'm very confident that there is a different way of thinking in this field. And I'm also very confident, I'll give you endless examples, that if I were a computer scientist not thinking this way, and I was hired by Esri to write software, the result would be awful. <laughs> Uh, one more question. You mentioned that um, 
you were thinking of this list of problems with GIS that were caused by the initial decisions that we yeah. made. Yeah. So, and you gave us one example. Right. Can you give any other one? Well, there's, there's several that derive from that issue of giving, of independently locating each point, right? right. Because it means you can't deal with positional accuracy issues. Um, so, um, what else? Um, what about layers? Um, so, um, we know that, um, well, this is CGIS again, right? So, Tomlinson et al. made the decision that a map of, for example, land cover would be representative in the vector domain implying that the transition from one area to the adjacent area would be instantaneous. Right? We know it's not. And we can't modify that model to accommodate that. Right? Because you can say, oh, well, all I need to do is vary the, uh, consider the positional accuracy of the, and people have put buffers around, around the boundaries. Right? Right. But that only takes care of that issue. It doesn't take care of the fact that if you had two people independently mapping, let's say, land cover, over the same area, the maps that they produced would not agree. They wouldn't agree on the positions of the boundaries. They wouldn't agree on the positions of the nodes. They wouldn't even agree on the existence of the polygons. The number of polygons would be different. And you can't retrofit a model of uncertainty onto that. You have to go immediately to the raster domain, which is where you've got enough ability to, to deal effectively with, with uh, uncertainty. So the decision that was wrong was to create a vector representation. And that, unfortunately, was where the vast amount of the effort that IBM expended and sort of other people expended on, on CGIS, the vast majority of it went into the raster vector conversion to take the scan maps and convert them to vector, which I would say was a bad decision. I, I mean, at the time it wasn't, because they were dealing with limits in numerical processing capability and with limits in storage capability. So at the time, that was the best solution. Oh. Uh -huh. So the first contract I ever had with Environment Canada in 1972 was to take the vector representations because in 1972 the Canadian government was frantically disowning CGIS and saying it was a ghastly waste of $20 million and had been hidden in the basement of an apartment building in Ottawa. And I was hired to go in there and do a simple vector back to raster conversion so that you could do something with it. Right. And you had layers of congruent rasters, and so you could easily do simple analysis on congruent rasters using a very small machine. In 1972, you could do it on a very small machine. So, no, I, I think it was, uh, it, you can see why they did it, well, apart from the fact that everybody working for IBM didn't have any geography background. Um, but, uh, this, well, Roger did. Um, they did it because if you regarded the data as potentially pure, that was the logical way to do it. It was more accurate. I think we will leave it there. We yes. will actually will <laughs> we have, have the last yeah. question. But Dr. Well, Wright yes. is going to, uh, uh, <clears throat> Doug and Dr. Wright are, of course, our hosts. And Dr. Rice is going to invite you to stay. So please. Yep. Um, please enjoy the refreshments, uh, and uh, we'll spend uh, five or ten minutes uh, uh, continuing the conversation. Okay? Thank you. Uh, maybe we can find Oh, my goodness. I think 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 I